All right, what an exciting morning. Got to meet some new people. Got to meet a young lady in from the Philippines who I was excited to meet. She's getting married on Saturday. And so how special is that? And first Sunday in America, what does she want to do? She wants to come and hear me preach. I mean, is that not cool or what? And so, yeah. She's like, I'm not even staying for the Thanksgiving lunch, and after you're done, I'm out of here. Because it was, and so, yeah. <laughs> Why do I think that that's a lie? What I want to talk about today, is, I want to talk about the gift of eternal life. And, and I love how all the songs came together, because, you know, if there's one thing I'm thankful for this morning, it is the gift of eternal life. And, and you know, it's, it's that it is a gift. It's not something I had to work for. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, It is the gift of God. It is a gift of God. It is not a work so that no one could boast. Amen. Because, I mean, how many of us, the day that we had done enough to inherit eternal life, would walk around, oh, yeah, guess what I just did? And then lose it, right? Yeah. I had a friend who used to say that he was given a badge for humility and they took it away because he wore it all the time. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's the way we do. That, that's the way we are. The moment that we do something and we accomplish something, we become prideful about it. But that eternal life is a gift makes it so much more precious. Amen. Because it's a gift I could never earn. It's a gift I can never be good enough for. Yes, amen. I can never stand face to face with God and feel somehow I should be in His presence. The amazing thing about that is every now and then He stands in my presence. Yes. Seeking me out. Coming to me. And most of the time when he does, it's those moments when I feel the most unworthy. It's those moments when, when sometimes I'm most embarrassed to have him around. So much like that moment in the Garden of Eden. When God began to walk through the garden, and He said, "Adam, where are you?" Not that, not that He didn't know where He was, but He wanted Adam to know, "I recognize our fellowship has been broken, and I'm searching for you." See, that is the God we serve. That is how amazing our God is. Our God says, "I understand." that fellowship has been broken. I understand that it was on you that fellowship is broken and I want you to know that I am coming looking for you. That is what the gift of eternal life is. It is the God of heaven and earth coming and looking for us for a relationship. Open up with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. And I want to look at a story today, a parable that Jesus tells that really kind of just defines the gift of eternal life. Jesus has just had a moment with a man, a rich young man who came before him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to have this gift? What must I do to possess it? Because the man was empty. He had everything he could ever want. He had money. He had power. He had prestige. And emptiness. Because of the thing, because the things of this world cannot fill the emptiness within us. Yes, so he went to Jesus and said, What must I do to have the emptiness in my life filled? And Jesus said, I'm going to tell you, I want you to walk away from everything you have. And then you will inherit eternal life. And you guys are like, oh, well I can't do that. And so he left empty. And so as he left empty, 
Jesus begins to tell this parable. Starting actually at verse 30 of 19. He says, But many of you, many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them into his vineyard. And I want to stop there, because what I want to point out is Jesus, who is the landowner, goes out into the marketplace. And what would happen every morning is a large group of people would begin to gather in the marketplace. These were people who had no skill or trade, and so they, they didn't they couldn't provide for their family. These were people who were one step above beggars. Because if they, didn't, if they went three or four days without having work to do, they would be begging. That is who these people were. They were the low people on the totem pole. They were made up of all sorts of people, older people, younger people, middle-aged people. They were the people who would come into the marketplace not to buy or sell, but to try to find employment for the day. It was what they did every day. And it says that he went at the beginning of the day, at the first hour. That would be six in the morning. These people would get up and they would rush to the marketplace to be there at 6 a.m., so that at the first light, pretty much, somebody would possibly be willing to hire them to work for the day. Now, if you can imagine, these unskilled people would do anything for any amount of money, but they were being paid a denarius. The significance of that is that was what the Roman soldiers made for a day. That's why it was considered a day's wage. Most people didn't make that. Especially not these people. But he goes into the marketplace. And he offers them more than anyone thought they were worth. I just think that's so beautiful. It's so incredible because how often does the world rob us of what little worth we have? Didn't really matter who was going to hire these people. They knew they were going to be unappreciated for what they did. Didn't matter who hired these people, they knew they wouldn't be respected for the things that they did, that they wouldn't be valued for the worth that they had. And Jesus comes in and says, I'm going to give you a different value. Jesus comes in and says, I'm going to place upon you a value that nobody else will place upon you to do a job that no one else would ask you to do. what I love about Jesus. Jesus comes looking for us and he sees in us something that no one else sees. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. He finds a value in us that no one else will respect or honor. Glory. He says, I don't care how unskilled you are. I don't care how hopeless you may seem in life. I don't care about any of the things you've done or haven't done in the past. I'm going to offer you more than what anyone else would say you're worth because of the value I've put. Yes, amen. And so he went out and he got them. And what we what we begin to understand is that his offer is based more upon his grace than our worth.
Because most of us, when we look at ourselves, we realize the things that we can't accomplish on our own. We realize the things that we can't do on our own. We realize the things that we do on a regular basis that we wish we wouldn't do. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you what. I will give you something based upon the graciousness of my heart that no one else is willing to offer. So these people no doubt went out into the field excited. They were going to get paid a denarius. They were going to get paid a day's wage at the end of the day. They were stoked about that because they never made that kind of money. They never got treated like that. And so they go out there. And then it says about the third hour, which is nine o'clock, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And they weren't standing there doing nothing because they were lazy. They were standing there waiting for a job. It might have been that they worked for an hour or so and then went back to see if anyone else would hire them. It may be that they're like most of us and they just like to sleep in a little bit in the morning. And so they were just now getting there. Or it could be that they came from a lot farther distance away. It doesn't matter why they're there. What matters is that he goes and he sees them. And he told them, you also don't work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went out. You notice, he doesn't tell them what they're going to be paid. He just says, go work and I'm going to give you a fair wage. And they said, you're on. And they took off and they went. He went out again about the sixth hour, which is noon. And about the ninth hour, which is three o'clock. And they did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, which is five o'clock. He went out and found still others standing around and he asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? It's because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, You go also and work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. And this was something that honorable Jewish people did. If they brought you in to work, they paid you that day, according to the law of Moses. Because they understood that you were the people that did not have a lot of money. They understood that these day workers were not people that had a lot of money. This was going to be their provision so that they could go to the market and buy stuff so that they could feed their family. No doubt they would go home and they would hand the money to their spouses and, and their spouse would the next day go to the marketplace with them in the morning and buy what they needed to feed the family. Because there was no daily income. There was no guarantee. And this is what they had. And this is what they did. And so if he had a good day and he got to work, he would go home based upon what he had done yesterday and be able to eat with his family. Or not. And so it was important to remain honorable that you paid every day at the end of the day. <coughs> the workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and they received a denarius. They worked one hour and they received a full day's pay. So with those who came who were hired first so when those came who were hired first they expected to receive more but each of them received a denarius and when they received it they began to grumble against the landowner these men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you, 
have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So what this story is all about, this story is about the gift of eternal life that we receive, and Jesus is making the point that it doesn't matter when you come to know Him, you will receive the full amount. Amen. Now the people who came first, they're like, are you kidding me? We worked all day long. And at first they were thinking, wow, those people that came at the end of the day, they got this, they got a whole day's wage. That means us who worked all day long, we're going to get more. And so they're all excited thinking, wow, who knows how much we're going to get by, by the time it comes to us. And then they came to those who, who started at the ninth hour and they got the same wage. And those at the third hour, or the sixth hour, the third hour, and they're like, wait a minute. So they started getting mad. See, the point of this wasn't to talk about the greatness of heaven. It was to talk about how those who come, no matter when you come, receive the same gift. Hallelujah. Jesus understood how his disciples thought. He understood how people in general think. Anyone thinks they should get more for doing more? Yeah. And when someone does less, have you ever worked with someone who did less who made more? Yeah. I know they're called supervisors. But <laughs> <laughs> and you watch those people and they do less and you're like, how in the world do they get more for what they do? When they do less. And we get mad and we begin to get angry and we begin to, to be bitter about it. And Jesus says, remember, I set a wage that you were okay with. I set a wage and you said, I'm fine with that. I'm excited about that wage. And the only reason you changed was because you realized how gracious I was. For that we get greedy. We always want more. Now, absolutely, there is a component of heaven, and Paul talks about it, where we earn rewards for while we're in heaven. But the gift that is given is the same to everyone. Amen. Hallelujah. I knew a guy named Mike once. I know a lot of Mikes, but this particular Mike. He was a drug dealer. And he just happened to connect with my friend Bobby. Bobby was a mobile mechanic. And Bobby was Bobby was great. He would come and he would take your car apart. And he would then say, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put it back together after you finish letting after you, I'm finished telling you about Jesus. Oh. And if you would say, I'm not interested, he'd say, Okay, well when you watch your car put back together, let me know and I'll come back tell you about Jesus and put your car together. <laughs> Bobby was great that way. And and so this guy Mike used to always call Bobby to work on his car so he could talk to him about Jesus. Wasn't ready to, to leave his drug business. Wasn't ready to leave the life that he had lived his whole life. Until one day, this 34-year-old man a massive heart attack. And he was in the hospital and they said, you have about 8% of your heart still functioning. And the first thing he did was he called up my buddy Bobby. He said, hey, I'm, I'm in the hospital. My car's fine. I'm not. Will you come and sit with me? And so on a Saturday afternoon, Bobby drove down there and met with him. He gave his life to Jesus. Hallelujah. 
on Sunday I, I drove out and I met with him and I said man I can't wait to watch how God uses you on Monday God took him home he was a believer for less than 36 hours and yet he received the riches of eternal life Hallelujah. Glory. Because it doesn't matter when you come. What matters is that you come before you. Yeah. But you know, my buddy Mike, he still gets his story told. And I got to do his funeral. And there was before me a large crowd of people that knew Mike as a drug dealer. And I got to talk about Mike, the man of God. I got to talk about a man who had decided he was going to spend the rest of his life honoring the Lord. And everyone's like, who's this Mike you're talking about? I'm talking about a Mike that met Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. A Mike who understands how to have fulfillment in life. Because oh, isn't that what we're looking for? Yes, amen. Isn't that at the heart of what every person is looking for? And I think it's at the heart of this story. Not only was this offer based upon grace, But salvation was offered to those who were looking for purpose. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Salvation was offered to those people who when they would come into the marketplace, they had no purpose in their life. They had no direction in their life. They had no one who was willing and trusted them to do regular work. But Jesus saw them and said, I'm going to give you purpose. Because purpose so often brings that fulfillment when we have something to live for. See, it's as if Jesus has come into the marketplace and he's walking around looking for people that need purpose in life. He's looking for people that aren't sure where they're supposed to fit in or how they're supposed to fit in. And, and I don't know, if you're like me, most of the time you walk around society and you just kind of scratch your head and think, I'm sure I don't fit in here. And you begin to talk with people and you begin to try to connect with people and, and you're just always unsure. You just think, do I belong here? So Jesus said, I'm going to find those people and I want to bring purpose to their lives. That's what his offer of salvation is. His offer of salvation is an offer for purpose. And the reason it becomes purpose immediately is not because now all of a sudden we're incredibly skilled, not because now all of a sudden we're incredibly, incredibly eloquent and because we can now live perfectly before him. It's none of those things. The reason we now have purpose the moment that we begin to go into the vineyard and work for him, the moment we accept his offer, his free gift, is because we want to show ourselves well. Jesus says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you out into the vineyard. I'm going to give you this amount of money. Go earn it for me. Go show me something. 
And it's not that we could ever earn that. It's not that those people could ever earn the gift that was given to them. He said, I'm going to give you a denarius for going out into the field and working. And when you go out into the field and work all day, it is hard work. The sun's beating down on you. And, and you're just needy and gritty in the dirt and the dust. And you're just exhausted. And could you imagine a 12-hour shift of that? Why, yeah. But purpose comes over the excitement for the gift. Amen. Yes. Purpose begins to come when we realize what has been given to us. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you what. I want you to go out now into my field and begin to work and begin to labor. And, and that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like as we begin to try to expand it because we now go out with purpose. Our purpose is to expand the vineyard so that the vineyard begins to grow. Yes, amen. And so now we go out with one purpose and one purpose only no matter where we go and that is to express the greatness of our Lord and Savior wherever we go. The song that we sang earlier, Good, Good Father, it's, it's rapidly becoming one of my favorite songs for the depth of its message. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tenderness of love. So many people out there think they know who our Jesus is. They think they understand who our Jesus is because they've met people before who talked about Jesus but hadn't had their life completely transformed yet. And there, there are people out there that have been hurt because they knew people who were trying to be perfect for Jesus and, and they hurt other people because that's what we do. We still aren't perfect yet. We still, we go out and we hurt people. That's why it's so important we're humble enough that we go out and say, hey, you know what, I'm sorry, I just blew that one. Yes, amen. Because that is when people really begin to understand the greatness of who our Jesus is. You just came and said, sorry? No one ever does that. Well, I live with purpose now, and my purpose is that you would know the greatness of my Jesus. And some people, their purpose is defined because they work with young people. Some people work with high schoolers, some college age, some with young married couples, some with, with the elderly. We all have a different area that's our niche. Some people, some people serve the Lord by just cleaning things and, and fixing things and making things look right. Yes, amen. We all have different ways in which we begin to share the love of Jesus, but we now have purpose, and the purpose is that every single person we come in contact with would understand the Jesus that is changing our life. Praise God. Hallelujah. But the only way that happens is if Jesus is actually in the middle of our life. And sometimes that's hard to get to. I know when we came in this morning and we began to pray as a praise band, I just said, Lord, right now it just needs to be you. It needs to not be Thanksgiving lunch. It needs to not be Thanksgiving dinner on Thursday. It, not needs, it needs to not be anything but you because we've just been running around and if we don't clear our heads right now, worship will be a train wreck. It's we just stopped. See, the only way we can keep Jesus as the central purpose of our life when we go out and we do the things that we do is if Jesus is right here. Amen. Hallelujah. And no, we're not worthy to have Jesus right here. Amen. We're not worthy to have Jesus walk through the garden and say, Where are you? Fellowship is broken. I miss you. Where are you? Come and be with me again in my presence. We don't deserve that. Yes, amen. That's why it's a gift. Lord. Which makes it so much more special. God is calling people to a purpose. He's calling us to live 
for him. Yes, amen. He's calling us to share his love everywhere we go. And in the gratefulness and thankfulness of the gift that we have received, it becomes so easy when we remember our gratefulness. Sometimes, though, we're like those people that were hired the first hour. We're just like, are you kidding me? I've been working out here all day in the hot sun, and you're still bringing people in? And they're going to make the same amount of time, aren't they? Some of those people are only going to work an hour or two, and they're going to get the same amount. I've already worked an hour or two. Can I just quit now? Anyone ever had that thought? Lord, can't you just bring in someone new? And I know his first response is, well, I'm waiting for you to bring someone new. Sometimes we, sometimes we forget how amazing that gift is. When he told them what their pay was going to be, they were overjoyed. No one pays us that much. <coughs> and then by the end of the day, they were ungrateful. Because they, they forgot how great the gift was. My challenge is this. Are you working in the vineyard? We all have different jobs in the vineyard. Not everyone that went into the vineyard that day was pruning. Some people were moving rocks. Some people were making retaining walls. Some people were, were taking the pruned branches be burned. Everyone had a different job. But they all had purpose. Yes, amen. Are you working in the vineyard? Fulfilling the purpose that God has for you. purpose, if you're not sure, I would love to talk to you. I would love to excite you about what God has for you. Because experiencing that Jesus in that way is as easy as ABC. It's admitting that you have a need. That's what those people were doing when they went into the marketplace. They came to the marketplace and said, I have a need. I can't do this on my own. I have a need. They believed that Jesus was the way that was made for that need to be met. And they chose him. Jesus said, I'm offering eternal life. if you work my vineyard. When he offered those people the pay that he was offering them, they ran to the vineyard. They couldn't believe they were going to get that. They didn't work hard to earn it. Jesus didn't say, I'll give you this wage if you do this, 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 and this. Jesus said, just go into my vineyard and I'll give you this wage. Jesus is offering you eternal life. Not because of the work you'll do, but because of His grace. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to pray that you will, you will allow us to meditate this week upon, upon the riches of eternal life. 
and Lord upon our purpose Lord that we would be a people of purpose who go out with purpose who come back with purpose who speak to others with purpose who minister with purpose and who love with purpose The only way we can do that is to live on purpose. So may we live on purpose so that we can live with purpose. And Father, may your purpose be the driving force in our life. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you're here today and you're speaking need pray over, I need strength, I need purpose, whatever it is. My wife Natalie and I are going to be up here. We would love to pray with you. Stand and join with us as we sing our closing song.